So let's just touch on this double digit growth that we're expecting and, and, and I'd like to compare it to the interest rate which is sitting at 10 and a quarter of a percent, no change there. We've got uh, inflation figures which is expected at least the target to come down to around 10 percent and we also have growth which is going to sit at around uh, 10 percent. So all in double digits at this point in time. So give us an indication of how this balancing act can actually occur. Okay, so I think when looking at Angola, I think uh, the, the most notable development that we're going to see this year is a return to double digit growth. At RMB, we're forecasting growth of 10% uh, of GDP. And I think that's encouraging. That's largely on the back of uh, oil prices and oil production, which is uh, robust at this stage. And an IMF report uh, coming out also saying that, and I'm glad you mentioned the oil prices because that's, uh, you know, recovered, production mm. has recovered. But the IMF saying that, you know, Angola really needs to put various uh, risk mitigating factors in place to ensure that if we do see a drop in the oil price, then Angola won't be at such a, a large risk. What sure, that's, that's a definite long-term challenge, and I think that's, there's no getting away from the structural constraints of the Angolan economy. I think in the IMF, um, the sixth review under their standby arrangement, which came out last month, they praised the country's progress in terms of macroeconomic management on the fiscal and monetary front. Um, inflation was trending downward from the 15% it was in December 2010. Um, I think reserves have, have built up quite substantially to about 26 uh, billion US dollars. Uh, and I think the currency has largely been stable. So there has been progress in terms of the overall short term management of the economy over the, 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 the short term under this 27 month facility. Longer term, there are a number of, of challenges. Uh, there's no getting away from the fact that Angola is very oil dependent. And there need to be attempts to diversify the economy, economy away from that. And I think the authorities are starting to, to become aware of that fact. Of course, and I mean, the IMF and I alluded to the, the report again, they were talking about a five to 10 year plan that Angola needs to come up with. But I'd like to also just go back to the 2008, 2009 financial crisis where we did see fluctuations in the oil price back then as well. Mm. I mean, what kind of changes have actually occurred? I mean, would you say that Angola is in a far better place to deal with, with any kind of uh, you know, volatility on that front? I think compared to 2008, it's definitely in a, in a much better position and the biggest change is the managerial capacity. I think they've made substantial changes in reducing the non-oil uh, fiscal balance from 67% in 2008 to 30% now. And last time they were just blatantly unprepared. They were caught with their pants down and uh, they were overspending. They didn't have any oversight. And I think there has been substantial progress made in that regard. I think one of the, the biggest developments is the fact that um, you know, they've set up a, a debt management unit and that's a central point for the Ministry of Finance to monitor, evaluate and execute loans. So that's a substantial um, development in that regard. Also, with reserves having been built substantially and import cover at around 7%, um, that creates a bit of a buffer in terms of a currency blowout and a balance of payments crisis. Okay, so I mean, just speaking of balance of payment crisis, I'd like to talk about the, the potential discrepancy that is expected to be announced of around $32 billion. Uh, what is your view on this? I mean, obviously the market must be pricing some kind of, you know, volatility and given the fact that we're still already talking about the number and it hasn't formally been announced as yet. Uh, we spoke to the IMF when uh, we were in the country a, cu a couple of weeks ago and we tried to get to the bottom of, of that story and that 32 million uh, billion yeah, US yeah. dollars uh, that's supp supposedly missing is expected to be explained in terms of forensic accounting later in the year. Uh, the IMF uh, attributes the the discrepancy to some of the quasi state operations of Sonangol, the, the state owned oil company, uh, and they expect it to, to be explained away towards the second half of the year. So I think um, we'll, we'll wait and watch that space. But uh, I mean, it, it just talks to the, the transparency issues that, uh, that are prevalent. Um, or the lack of transparency that's, that's so prevalent in, in Angola. I guess a 27 years of a war, of course, mm. uh, you know, that's ending around a decade ago, but a lot of money pumping, getting pumped into infrastructure spend. There's still a lot of room to spend on infrastructure. Do you think this is one of the big opportunities that lies ahead for Angola? Uh, definitely. If, if you're in Luanda, you just have a look at the skyline. You just see cranes and, um, I mean, their, their plan is to turn it into the Dubai of Africa. I think a lot of time people often focus on hard infrastructure and uh, what we really need to be ca careful of is, is not neglecting the soft infrastructure because that is, um, you know, that's, that's really what's going to foster inclusive growth and, and filter through to, to the entire population. I think one of the biggest issues that, that came out uh, of our visit to Angola was the fact that the skills level and the education level in the country is extremely low. So uh, a lot of the time companies uh, are have to train uh, local 
local people uh, who are then poached by the public sector, which in a way is good, I guess, um, in the sense that it, it uh, professionalizes the, the public sector. But in terms of doing business in the country, it makes it a very tricky and, and challenging exercise in, in the sense that you're investing resources and human capital in upskilling people and you know, you're not really feeling the benefit of that.